They say never work with animals or children. Well, I'm a dad right now, so all I, I do uh, is work with children. Um, maybe not live on camera, but um, the way I put it these days is I'm either changing lives or changing diapers, and there's not much room for anything else in between. But uh, when it comes to, to broadcasting, uh, they say, you know, never work with animals or children, but I think uh, technology too. We've just been doing all the teething issues with the technical things behind the scenes. But here we are, and I'm glad we're here. Um, um, it feels like it's been a while since we've done a, a live call like this. I'm, I'm really glad we've got a chance to share with you the event we did from London. Um, it, it, was, it was a powerful event. We had people fly in to be there, and I, I'm glad we got to. We broke it up for you, and, and I wanted to share it with you. Ah, but it's been it's been an interesting time for me these last few months. Is is the truth? Uh, it's the truth. Uh, you know, life is life is life. It's um, stuff goes on. My father passed away in October. Um, I just flew back to England recently to. We had a service for him, and, and we scattered his ashes and. Uh, and in between time, I've been raising two little boys. We have a one-year-old and a three-year-old, and that's the reality of being a coach, uh, being an entrepreneur, being a business owner. You, you're living life. So here we are. There's a few things I wanted to bring into the room today. The first is just bringing in the reality for me, seeing the patterns where I hold myself back the most. You know, some of the deepest work I've ever done has been in my men's group. Not because it's a men's group, not because they're powerful men in that group, although they are, but because week after week after week for six years, we've got together and we've shared our deepest secrets and our deepest dreams. We put them out there and sometimes we hold each other accountable. Sometimes we challenge each other that we're not dreaming big enough or we're dreaming too big. Um, I've got a friend in the group whose project right now is to raise a billion dollars to make a difference to poverty. And whilst we have no doubt that is happening, really the, who this man is, that project's on its way, we had to slow him down to raise his first 100,000 on that project to bring in some of the team he needs to make it happen. And he's now done that. So by slowing him down on that huge dream, that huge dream is closer than it's ever been. We have a rocket scientist in the group. We have men who have uh, million dollar businesses. And, and in some ways none of that's relevant. It's simply the fact we get together week after week after week and we hide nothing and we hold nothing back. One of the most powerful exercises we do with each other is an exercise I've, I've talked about before a little bit. It's what I don't want you to know about me. And we put out there everything that we would normally want to hide. I, I was emceeing this last weekend at the Association of Transformational Leaders. It was an organization run and created by uh, Jack Canfield, uh, who wrote Chicken, Chicken Soup for the Soul. And so it, the room was full of powerful transformational leaders. And, and I, I emceed for the day, and I was, I was nervous. I'd never emceed before. I've led events many times, never emceed before. But something interesting happened for me. So I want to take you back to the men's group. In, in the group, a few weeks back, we began to say, OK, let's look at each man, and let's, let's see his shtick. What's his thing? What's his way of being in the world that helps him to succeed but also holds him back at the same time? What's his shtick? What's his way of being in the world that has got him to the level he's at today but is keeping him from getting to the next level of success? So what I don't want you to know about me is that the, the, name, is the name they came up with for me. Uh, we have a man in the group who's now known as Bleeding Valentine. We have a man in the group who's known as Hollywood Jesus. We have a man in the group who's known as Hidden Tantrum. We even have a man in the group who's known as Fucking Shoot Me because all he does is put out his pain and his drama. The name they came up with for me is Catwalk Garbo. 
Now I explained this. I said this to a friend of mine a couple of days ago, and, and, and she just laughed and went, "Oh yeah, yeah, that's you." And I was like, "Hang on, what do you mean? Like, you, surely you need me to explain it to you?" She's like, "No, no, no. They've nailed you." Well, that was, it's horrible. I don't I don't like it at all. And that's how you know that they've got you. Um, that's your shtick. Hollywood um, uh, catwalk Garbo. Well, the catwalk is the performance element of me, and, and it was on show this weekend at the Association of Transformational Leaders. I was there on the stage holding the room in the palm of my hand. I know how to perform. I've learned it throughout most of my life. It comes from my, my pain and my struggle because I, I never felt confident. I always felt lacking in power. So I learned to make up for it by being a performer. Garbo refers to Greta Garbo, who's famous for saying, I want to be alone. And that's that part of me that's an introvert, that wants to pull back, that, that feels kind of elusive to people. Um, and, and actually, I realize draws people in. And Catwalk Garbo was on show this weekend. Um, I talked about being an introvert. I talked about the fact that as much as everyone at these events seems to love each other and want to hug each other, it, that overwhelms me. It's too much stimulation for my senses, so I want to pull back. After an event, after a, a, a talk, when everyone wants to mingle, I want to go and sit in a room on my own. After an event like that, my wife's an extrovert, so she's, she gets um, filled with energy and wants more of it. Um, I get filled with energy and it's too much, or it drains me of energy, I should really say. I need to recover. And, and so that Catwalk Garbo character that, that I embody really draws people in, really has helped me to succeed at the level I'm at today. And at the same time, is holding me back from that next level of success. So, so all I invite you to do right now is begin to reflect on that. I've been taking some of my clients through this exercise this week to look at like what's, what's their shtick? What's their way of being that has helped them to succeed at the level they're at today, but is actually holding them back from the next level of success? And it's painful, and it's uncomfortable, and it's embarrassing even um, to, know, to know this. But it's so powerful, and I, and I see it happening in the moment. I, I run a small group right now of coaches, and I told them about this. And, and afterwards, I posted in a little private Facebook group. We run a picture of Greta Garbo to illustrate um, the story. But I picked this great, beautiful photo with an awesome quote underneath, and then I called it. And only Catwalk Garbo would find the best, most amazing photo of Greta Garbo with an amazing quote underneath that made it seem powerful. Because the truth is I'm embarrassed to be called Garbo. It's a woman, for God's sake. It's, the whole thing doesn't... But here I am. This, this persona persists and shows up even when I don't want him to, especially when I don't want him to. Because he's helped me get to the level I'm at today. It's not comfortable. What I want to do today is introduce you to someone who I've got to know because she is a member of Evercoach. She joined us here in Evercoach, um, got to read the book, um, got introduced to me by mutual friends, and we've dived in deep enough that she's come to some of my intensives and has actually become my apprentice. Here's the interesting thing. When I tell you about Jackie, who I'll bring in in just a moment, um, we discovered within about two conversations, having invested $75,000 and all the energy and commitment it takes, to be an apprentice, we realize she probably doesn't want to be a coach. And it turns out that doesn't matter. She's not apprenticing with me in order to become a coach. She's apprenticing with me for exactly the reason I've just been talking about. That everything we do to become as successful as we are is what keeps us at that level we're at. If we want to get to the next level of success, no matter how amazing we are, I only work with high performers. So when they come to me, they're already performing at a really high level. There's always something beyond that. And anything you do that you've done until now is destined to keep you at the level you're at. I'm only interested in what will take you to beyond that, and then beyond that, and then beyond that. So hi, Jackie. Hi, Rich. Hey. So thank you for bearing with us with the technical issues this morning. No worries. Jackie and I had to do some deep breathing this morning to get really centered <laughs> and ready for this call. 
Jackie, take, take me back. You, you, you came into Evercoach, like the people who are watching. What, what, what drew you in? What, what, why did you come into Evercoach? Um, so I left my previous career to become a coach, and I, I really wanted a mentor. And I was looking for a mentor for a year and asking everyone I knew to, to help me find this, this mentor. And um, I'd read your book and then completely forgot about it. And, um, and I saw something about, about Evercoach. And I don't even know why I signed up, I think, because the price was right. And, um, and then when I heard you speak, just like the way you knew you wanted to marry Monique after 10 days of knowing her, I knew that I needed to work with you. Um, but at the time, I, I had all, all of my stories, like why would you work with me? I've only been coaching for a short time. and um, But I, I knew you were the one that I wanted to work with. And so I had mutual friends introduce us. And at the time, I was in the Middle East and... Um, I saw you post about Liberia, and I had emailed you about that opportunity, but I spelt your name wrong, so, so you never got it. Um, oh, so I know that that wasn't actually meant to be. Um, but I, I just knew that I wanted to work with you, and then I, I checked your website, and you had this page about an apprenticeship. And since I had previously mentored clinicians in um, my career as a speech pathologist, um, that was the relationship that I wanted. I wanted to learn from the best and, and have this type of relationship. Um, and so I was really excited to find out that, you know, of course you, you had exactly the relationship that I wanted, but then when you said the cost, <laughs> I nearly choked and died. Um, and I thought, wow, there's no way I could ever do that. Um, and then, you know, the next day I was offered this opportunity to go work in Saudi Arabia and, um, so that that money manifested immediately, and here we are. Mm. So I, I want to talk about a couple of aspects of that. The, the manifestation for you is something that comes very naturally. I want to kind of tease that out for for, for people. Um, but let's let's continue on your journey for a little bit. So so take us back in time, like like before Saudi Arabia. What what was your background? What were you doing? Um, so for. 15 years I was working as a speech pathologist specializing in autism and at one point I had a, a private practice and then I was working at a world-renowned clinic in Manhattan. Um, some clients brought me to Beverly Hills, Dubai, Saudi Arabia. Um, but in, the, in between I, I left behind that profession to become a coach and um, my first coaching gig was leading a retreat in Puerto Rico and then doing workshops on a retreat in Costa Rica and coaching on a tech incubator in, in Chile and um, so nothing logical um, in that path and then I ended up working with children in Dubai and Saudi and um, and that, that, that kind of takes us to where we are today. So again, I'm going to take you back. I'm going to keep teasing out some stuff in, in your okay. journey because I think it's interesting for people. Uh, speech pathology interests me. Tell me more. Um, just, I'm, I'm fascinated by language. Uh, my background's in teaching. I, I taught in Botswana, in Brunei. Um, I, I had to learn to teach kids in their third language. So I had to become very careful in the way that I spoke, and I, that's really served me as a coach. I became very good at listening, and, and that also served me. And I'm wondering whether the background in speech pathology uh, helps you have distinctions around listening and speaking and words and language. Um, yeah, it definitely does, um, because a, a lot of the children that I've worked with are nonverbal, so I, I, I have to um, work with body language and um, nonverbal cues and gestures and, um, and, and just really listening to people. Um, yeah, I never really thought about the connection in, in that way, but... I, I've also, I, I've worked, I volunteered in Africa and, and I was able to teach children who only spoke, uh, not even Swahili, um, in the Pokot. And they, these children, we, we had no way to verbally communicate, um, but I was able to teach them to play Duck, Duck, Goose and Red Light, Green Light and all, all these children's games. 
um, so it, it's really powerful. Yeah, what that speaks to, to for me is is listening behind the words, which mm -hmm. I think is our, our secret job as a coach. If you only listen to the words of your client, you're not going to go where they really want to go. Is listening behind the words. Some of that is body language. Some of that is intuition. Um, some of that is just this sense of deep listening and, and a, a sense of presence. And what about the the fact that some of the kids and many of the kids you work with are autistic? So for me, autism is. I, I had a client once who. Um, uh, dyslexia was was her thing. So she she created a charity, a nonprofit. She got an award from the British Prime Minister for her work around dyslexia. The way she described that is that dyslexia is simply a way of seeing the world differently. Uh, Richard Branson says that actually he's famously dyslexic. Richard Branson says when I was a kid at school, they used to laugh at me because I got my letters and my words mixed up. So I had to pull out and see the bigger picture. Now I pull out and see the bigger picture. They call me a visionary. They call me a genius. And I'm imagining with autism too. There are some some links with, with genius there. T tell me more. Um, so, autism is a huge spectrum. So on the lower end, there's um, you know more of the the mental retardation and um, cognitive disability. But then on the higher end is the Asperger's, uh, the high functioning autism, where um, you'll see someone like Temple Grandin who. Um, wrote a book, I think it was called Thinking in Pictures, and, and she talks about this ability to see the world differently, and um, and some people think of it as a disability, but it's actual, actually a, a special skill, and so people with autism do see the world differently, and, and maybe visually through pictures, or um, have all these, these different skills and abilities. Um, there's a there's a boy here at the clinic that um, if you tell him your birthday, he can tell you what day of the week it's going to fall on in 2016 in five seconds. And so um, they have these incredible gifts, and it, it's it's really fascinating. Each one is a puzzle. I like that. And same with our clients, really. It's, it's a puzzle to find out what's really going on. Mm -hmm. the, the, even on the other side, the cognitive disability, part of me is even interested in that. Now, I get that there's a spectrum and some people at the very far end of it, but cognitive disability, for me, that's often what our clients show up with. The cognitive, they're stuck in their cognition, they're stuck in their head, and there's a, such deeper wisdom in their heart or their gut intuition which they don't know how to access. Mm -hmm. So actually getting them out, especially when you work with high performers, because most of the time what gets the high performer to where they are is being up here in their head and, and actually giving them access to other parts of uh, their, their, their way of being or seeing the world is very powerful. That's true. So let's, let's bring us a bit more up to date right now then. So you, you, you came through Evercoach, through the book, through your friends. We had a connection. You said it was too much money and then you went out and created the money. Um, I, I've got a business plan for, for 10 years I had one one line business plan. I, I say uh, meet fun and interesting people. It's been my business plan for years. Meet fun and interesting people. When I do that, amazing stuff happens. And and a, a while ago I, I added in a, a, a word that, that really helped with that. Fun, interesting and resourceful. I don't need to meet fun, interesting and wealthy people. It's resourceful people. And resourceful means that they may have resources already, or they have the ability to create resources. And that's exactly what you did. That's what I had to do with each of my coaches. You know, Steve Hardizan charges 150 grand. Michael Neal, who I apprenticed with, charged 50 grand. I had to go out and create that money somehow, in order to work with them. And so I'm just I'm hearing that in you that that when you want something, you become resourceful. Yeah. Um, if I want something, I'll, I'll stop at nothing to get it. That interests me. That interests me because there's a quality in you that, that I saw in our first conversation. Because I think we knew. That that's why the chapter's in my book. It, the, the chapter says, never propose to a woman 10 days after you've met her. And it's used to illustrate every once in a while a client will show up. And it's okay to say, we should work together. I would love to work with you. If you do it too often, it, that's neediness. But once in a while, that's what happened with Vanessa, Vanessa Horn, who was one of my earliest apprentices. We had one call, I think, and both of us just knew. And we found a way to make it happen. Worked together for almost two years. So I, I want to 
tease out from you, well, two things really. Like one, we'll talk about the coaching and what you do and, and how you got some interesting opportunities so quickly. But it really relates to this other one, which is why I really want to have you here. You, you have a particular gift. It's what I would describe as you have this ability to manifest whatever you want. If there's something you want, you find a way to create it. And I want to really explore where that came out. You're in my program called 4PC. Um, that's the program. 4PC stands for 4%. It's the top 4% of coaches on the planet. And 4% also it relates to the, the book by Stephen Kotler, The Rise of Superman. He studied performance, high-performance athletes, the kind of people who jump off air, uh, mountains in a wingsuit, where they want to keep improving. Like, they want to keep better, better at what they do, but the tiniest of mistakes and they die. And what Kotler discovered in his research is that it's 4% is the area of improvement that's so tiny that for high performers, that they, they want to, they like, I want to improve by 10, 20, 50%, I hear a lot of the time, and it's too much. They blow past what they need to do to improve. And 4% and is actually too big for most people on the planet. But for, but for high performers, it's that 4% number. And, and you're in this group called 4PC, and you began to share with people in the room last time we met that you just create anything you want, and people were drawn to you. Everybody wanted, like, what, how, why? And they were just, they wanted to know more. Couldn't stop asking questions. And so what we've begun to do in our coaching together is to tease out what that looks like, because it can look like magic from the outside, but it's not magic. There are ways of being in the world, ways of seeing the world, ways that you show up, that I think are em eminently teachable. And I want to tease those out, because a lot of it you can't even see. It's a bit like we get in a car with a, 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 a with gears, as you say in the UK, or a stick shift, as you say in the States, and, and you drive for 10 miles, you get to your destination, you get out, and you've forgotten how you don't even know how you didn't even remember seeing stuff on the journey. Because that's, that's the highest level of competence, unconscious competence. You just do it without thinking, and, and you're there. Mastery is the level above that. Mastery is when you look down at what you do and you know how you do it. I could not teach my kids how to drive a stick shift car. It would be so confusing. That's why it causes so many arguments when husbands and wives try and teach each other. But we can begin to distinguish for you what this level of conscious, unconscious competence is. And I want to draw that out of you. Okay. So, so tell me, have you always been good in your life at, at creating whatever you wanted to do? I mean, it, it's definitely gotten uh, much stronger um, in recent years. I, I think I've always had the ability, but um, and now it's really become a superpower. And I was trying to pinpoint kind of when it started, and I, I haven't totally figured that out yet. Well, let's go back. You know, I, I put Catwalk Garbo out there at the start of um, this call, this session, because... It's embarrassing. I don't want you guys to know that about me. But it, it's true, though. It's, it's, it's my, my greatest struggle and my greatest gift at the same time. I felt that I've lacked confidence for so much of my life, lacked power for so much of my life. The, the hardest, you know, you know, and what it comes from is my attempt to prove myself to my dad. I've, for my entire life, been trying to prove myself to my dad. And what was painful and beautiful all at the same time was since he passed away, I mean, literally in the room, we were there as he passed away. My uncle was the only person, my mom, my two brothers, and my uncle, my dad's brother. The moment my dad passed, my uncle said, um, he's, you know, he was so proud of you guys, so proud of you boys. And that couldn't compute. I spent my whole fucking life trying to prove myself to my dad. And here it was like, I never needed to. Never needed to. And, and what came from my deepest pain became my greatest struggle and ended up being part of my greatest gift. Now, it's come to a level where it's holding me back and I want to move beyond that, but, but I see the thread. And I'm curious for you as I say that story out loud, if you can trace it back to a place where it probably didn't come from, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a gift in the way it began. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about that lately and, and looking back over my life and... Um, 
So I would say it probably began when my brother died six years ago. And that was the, the first time in my life where I, I started thinking about what would, what would my life look like if I were truly living for me? Because up until that point, I was caretaking everyone else, putting everyone else's needs before my own. Um, I had a private practice working with these children with autism, and they called me the autism whisperer. And parents would come to me in tears, can you please help my child? You have this gift. And so I would say, can I, can I see them at six in the morning or seven at night and um, until I got really burnt out, got a chronic autoimmune condition. And, and so then when my brother died, I, I thought about if I was truly living for me, what would that look like? And I decided it would be to take a year long trip around the world. And I had every reason not to do it. I had a grieving family. I had a private practice with kids that depended on me. Um, I had a mortgage, I had a car, I had all of the, the reasons that I, I wouldn't be able to live my dream. And I, I decided that I wasn't going to let anything get in my way. And so in that journey, I, I found myself and I, I traveled for a year and had all of these experiences that taught me about myself and I ended up... Um, at this retreat center in Australia where I had my first coaching experience. And um, when I got there, it was a, a treatment center for stress, depression, and anxiety, and I was so pissed off. I was like, I don't belong here. I'm training to climb Kilimanjaro. I'm supposed to be getting in, in a good headspace, and here I've got these people around me that are suicidal, and, um, you know, just the energy was so negative and, and not what I wanted. Um, and they told me that I would have to do their weekend intensive if I was there and, and I didn't want to do it. And um, so when I sat through it, it just pushed up against all of my beliefs, everything I thought to be true about the world, my sense of good and bad, right and wrong. And because it triggered me and, and made me so angry, I figured there must be something for me to learn there. So I ended up staying and doing three weeks of intensive coaching, mindfulness, meditation, and, and journey work. And that kind of shifted everything in my life and the way I saw the world. And So if I had to trace it back to something, I would say it's probably in that experience where things started to change for me and I really started to step into this power. So I really hear that. There was this moment when tragedy occurred in your in your family, and then that's where you said it's time to stop taking care of others. I wonder what happened if I took care of me. Yeah. Can I take you back before that though? Because what I'm hearing is that you became really good at supporting others, helping others, taking care of other people. Mm-hmm. When's the first time in your life you remember that experience? Like my job here is to take care of others. Mm. When I was in elementary school, or I don't know if it was elementary school or middle school, I, I used to give up my, my lunch time to spend taking care of the kindergarten. So that's probably the earliest. Why did you do that? What, what, what drew you to that? Um, I just I loved being around children, and um, and and since I've reflected a lot on this, I I, I know that now, um, probably for the same reason, you were always seeking love and validation. Um, I was looking for the the love that was absent in my family life. And so I would go be around these children who would fill me up and and I could take care of them and, and smother them with love and, and get the same in return. So it was it was for that reason that I you know, I didn't realize it then, but now looking back I can see that I was I was seeking love and, and validation. Hmm. So in your family life back then as a youngster it, there was an absence of love, at least how you felt it. Like that was just missing for you. Yeah, I um, 
I definitely did not have an ideal childhood. Um, my mother was a very cold, unemotional woman, and um, and my dad, he had a drinking problem. So there were days where he would disappear, or weekends that he would disappear, and um, so there was a lot of my life where I w I was feeling, you know, unlovable and not good enough, and and constantly I spent most of my teens and 20s seeking external validation of my worth and, and proving how good I am by being perfect and being a perfectionist overachiever and cool. trying to validate myself through my um, achievements. Yeah. For, for me, it's that feeling of not feeling worthy, like I'm not worthy is the, the, the sentence that's run me for so much of my life. Yeah. And for you, it was this, this desire for love, like just, and it began to manifest outwardly as like, well, I'll put it out on others, mm -hmm. because it, and then it came back to you. Yeah. I'm just imagining that little girl taking care of even tinier little kids and just feeling so great as it came back. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was so nurturing for me. and. Um, and even after my brother died, um, I just threw myself back into my work because I, I got so much love and joy from from these children, and and so that was what fed me and nourished me. And then it came this moment where what got you here won't get you there. There's this moment when you suddenly realize you've got this big window to let love out, but who's taking care of you? Where, where's right. like where's it really coming back to you? Not just in return, but just like where are you really being served and taken care of? And that's when you made this choice. I'm taking my year out. Yeah, I mean that was the start of it. I'm still that's still a work in progress, receiving and yeah. um, not overgiving and 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 caretaking and and mm -hmm. letting love in rather than just constantly giving it out. Yeah, I know that story very well. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so tell me then, what about this ability to manifest anything you want? Give me, give me a few examples of that to start with. So, for people who don't know you, like, yeah. Hmm. Um, okay. So, most recently at 4PC, we we made a list of all of the things that that we wanted in our lives, the things that we wanted to create for ourselves, and. And so I made this list, and within two days, I think I manifested half of it. And um, make it real. Give us an example of one of them. Yeah. Um, okay. So one of them was a, a spiritual connection with my brother that I felt like um, I'd kind of cut off our connection. And um, then Isabel Tierney, who's a beautiful light worker in the group, she did a session with me and I had this really beautiful experience where um, I, I could really feel him and it was really healing for me and so I mean that just happened because I asked um, so that was that was a pretty easy one but then um, well, well although you say that it's, it's you know, <laughs> funnily enough what holds most of us back from not having what we want is we don't ask right so, so let's, let's not brush over that. That's, that's not insignificant. <laughs> right. So I guess the bigger one is um, my my biggest dream um, is to have to revolutionize the therapy delivery model for special needs and to create these multidisciplinary clinics around the world and um, and so. Just before 4PC, I was contacted by a doctor that I used to work for and um, basically wrapped up in a pretty bow. He handed me my dream and um, with a you know promise of ten million dollars and um, and everyone at 4PC could see that it wasn't I, w I wasn't super lit up by it. Um, so I walked away from probably the largest amount of money that I could ever conceptualize in my, my bank account. And um, because it wasn't completely in integrity with my vision and um, it wasn't totally in alignment. And then... Well, let me, let me pause you for a second because you're, you're, 
I'm, I'm going to stay with how you manifest. You had a dream, a vision, you put it out there in the world and suddenly it appears like you're offered $10 million and the opportunity to have everything you want. The fact yeah. that you chose not to go there is, is a different subject we can come to, but, but I'm, I want to stay with this ability you have to create everything you want in life. Okay. Now, again, that could look like magic. I want to I wanna revolutionize the world of uh, uh, therapeutic world and suddenly I'm given $10 million and the opportunity to do that. How, how did that happen? Okay. Um, how did that happen? So, while I was on this trip around the world, I, I had this vision. Um, so, it's, it's been building over the past five or six years. Um, I've just been kind of collecting people that I'd like to work with. And um, I, I think the one thing that, that I do that I notice that other people don't really do so much is um, I, I think one distinction is not to let your, your ideas die inside you. Um, a lot of people are afraid to talk about their vision or what they want because they're afraid that if they don't actually achieve that or they don't get it or they don't do it, then there's shame or embarrassment or, um, or maybe they're afraid to talk about it because someone will steal their idea. Um, but it, it's been my experience that the more I talk about it, the more I share my vision with people, the more um, doors are open for me. So, um, you know, just recently I was at Summit Series, this event in Utah, and um, I was sitting in the ashram at midnight with some guy, and he asked me what I do, and, and I shared with him my vision. I had no idea who he was, and it turns out he's the chairman of Summit Series, and um, and he's working to create charter schools, and um, and and the next day, his friend um, was speaking uh, about this groundbreaking treatment for autism that he has, and um, and they're funding this research, and now potentially we're developing my vision together. Um, so if I had never spoken my dream out loud, I never would have met this this man or had this conversation and now this opportunity to be here in Del Mar working with this autism research and um, potentially developing my vision with these powerful people would have never been a reality. And so I, I say to to tell everyone and, and not be afraid because, well, most people are never going to take the time and energy to, to build your vision even if you tell them. And, um, and I think the other piece of it is not having an attachment to any outcome. And for me, I, I just say the most ridiculous things, like I'm going to space with Branson and, um, you know, all these crazy things that I want to manifest. And, and if, they, if they don't happen, I don't care. It, it doesn't make any difference to me. So, um, so not no, having... Let me, see, let me tease, those two part, tease those two bits apart. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're good to distinguish. First of all, talking about your vision, because I hear some people say, like, well, don't talk about your vision because then you will feel shame or embarrassment or, or, or bad about yourself if it doesn't happen. Keep it to yourself, keep it private. And I can see there are places and times when that's, that's important too. But, but I'm seeing for myself the same thing. This impossible goal I've taken on, I mean, it's truly impossible. I want to have five separate million dollar clients. Five separate clients pay me a million dollars I've been speaking this out loud, and first it was to my community and, and to the coaches I know, and that felt safe enough to do. But as I've begun to speak it out into the world, I've had three referrals to multi-multi-millionaires. Uh, I had a referral now to a billionaire. Like, like it, it's amazing me how close it's coming because I'm speaking it into the world. And, and I think there's something about how we speak it too. I, I notice it's about you. I don't speak it like... Let me tell you my dream, my vision, my hope for the future. Tell me how you speak it into the world, then I'll tell you what I do. Um, yeah, so I, I speak it into the world as if it's happening right now, and it's true right now. And so instead of saying, one day I hope to revolutionize the therapy delivery model, um, I'll, I'll say that, I'm working to revolutionize the therapy delivery model. And, and even if it's just an idea or a concept now and I've taken no action, 
the way I say it is so powerful that people are sucked into my vision and ask how they can be a part of it. And even though the how and all of that is so beyond what I can even conceive of now, um, people are drawn into the vision because they feel my passion and um, and because I'm speaking it as if it's true and, and happening right now. Yeah, that's, that's really key, I think. I, done, I did that with 4PC. I said I'm creating a group, curating a group of the top 4% of coaches on the planet, extraordinary coaches, and I moved aspiration out of the way. It's not, not you're aspiring to be, you have to be amazing. And have you noticed how amazing the people are in this group, Jackie? Like they're incredible, yeah. absolutely incredible. Because I spoke it into the world. I said that, and I've created that. I spoke into the world. I'm I'm enrolling five million dollar clients. Here's one thing that's interesting. I noticed even at the event I was at on the weekend, somebody came up to me later and, and was really triggered by what I said. Um, Rich, I've been coaching for thirty years, and I've never heard of you. Who are you to be telling people you've got this group of the top four percent of coaches? And she, I saw she was really really triggered, and and I, my my desire to please and my desire to be a nice guy was, you know, came up and I, I managed to resist it, like not to make her feel okay or to, to, to damp down what I'm doing. Well, of course she's never heard of me. I, I built, wrote a book on how to build a business by invitation and referral. I built this program that way. The coaches I'm working with are, are, are doing things that way. They're not the top 1% of coaches who have the huge email lists and the big names you'd have heard of. By definition, it's the top 4%. But I made myself not explain all that to her. And, and I'm just seeing how edgy it is for me when I really speak big stuff into the world. How some people get triggered. You have that experience? <laughs> yeah, 